or high school boys who have been lifelong friends rummaged through vinyl records in the back of the Silver Platter record store. Do check it out, Hammerheart from Bathory. This album kicks some serious ass. Not only that, but check out the artwork. It's fucking dope. The other three boys simultaneously nodded their heads in agreement. They were so focused on their current situation that they didn't notice the last customer had left the store and owner Neil Schwartzman had locked the door and lowered the window blinds. He flipped the sign of the door around so it read, closed, and hurriedly made his way to the back of the store where the boys had congregated. Hey guys, I want to show you something, but if I do, you have to promise to never speak of it once you leave this store. You're gonna try to fucking molest us or something? I am not going to turn my head and cough for you. I don't swing that way, you old dirty bastard. But Squits, well, he might. Chainsaw turned around and enthusiastically high-fived the rest of the boys as if he had just hit a home run in the bottom of the ninth to win the pennant. Nice. Well, I don't swing that way either, you little shit. You met my girlfriend Jeannie, so cut the crap. I have something to show you, though, that's gonna blow your freaking mind. But first, I really need your word that you will all keep your trap shut. This is gonna seriously change the way you listen to music forever. It's mind-blowing to say the least. Follow me. Neil opened the door to the storeroom. The boys looked at each other and shrugged their shoulders. What the fuck? There are four of us and one of him. If he tries to get all touchy-feely and shove his fingers up our asses, we can take him for sure. Let's just see what's up. With a mix of hesitation and curiosity, the boys cautiously followed the slightly balding, middle-aged store owner into the storage room. Close that door and make sure it's locked. This is crazy, Neil. All of this top-secret nonsense. What could possibly be in the back of this old record store that is so hush-hush? Get to it already. Neil smiled as he led the boys around a few dusty shelves stacked high with black concert t-shirts, LPs, and CDs. He pulled a small chain that dangled from the ceiling, and the room was instantly bathed in a soft, yellowish glow from the aging bare light bulb. Their gazes were immediately drawn to a large object sitting in the corner, covered by an old, tattered army green tarp. Check this out, fellas. Neil rubbed his hands together and smiled mischievously. I'm only showing you guys this because you are the most dedicated metal fans I've ever met. Sure, lots of people come into the store, many a lot older than you guys, but none more dedicated to the metal scene than you guys. I think this is something you guys are truly going to dig. Knock it off already. What the hell is it? Neil ripped the canvas off the object like a magician completing a grand illusion and revealed an extremely old, dusty Victrola phonograph player. What the? You brought us all the way back here to see a freaking record player from the 1800s? Who the hell cares, man? I ain't into these antiquities and all that shit. I'm into metal. Loud ass metal. And I doubt this can play anything at all, let alone anything loud. This, my friends, is an original 1890s Victrola record player with a 14K gold-plated horn. Isn't she a beauty? Whoopie fucking do! I don't get it. Come on, guys, let's get out of here. We have a long walk home, and I don't want to hear my mom bitch if I'm late. I have to be home by dinner time, and I ain't got time for this dumb shit. Who gives a rat's ass about some gold-plated record player from the Stone Age? The four boys made their way to the door. Leave if you want, but this is no ordinary record player. Yeah, it's an antique phonograph from the 1800s, but it can do something so freaking unbelievable, it will literally blow your minds. This bad boy right here is rumored to have once been owned by Jackson Arch, one of the nastiest, most evil guys to have ever lived. Which, in itself, is pretty metal, but according to legend, he placed a spell on it which transports the listener directly into the storyline or narrative of whatever song is playing. The boys stopped in their tracks. Um, uh, what do you mean, transports the listener into any song? I mean, supposedly... Any record you play on here will magically transport you into the storyline or narrative of the song. So if you were to play Iron Maiden's Run to the Hills, you would find yourself in the middle of a war between the settlers and the Indians. I was rummaging around Mixie's flea market and I saw this thing sitting on the floor in a cardboard box. It was all dusty and it looked like a piece of junk. I was intrigued by it though, and I wondered if I could get it running and maybe use it as a showpiece here in the store or something. 
So, long story short, I snagged it for under 100 bucks. When I was cleaning it up, I found this piece of paper in the drawer over here. Check it out. Neil produced an old, tattered, yellowing piece of paper with a bunch of barely legible handwriting on it and handed it to the boys. Jim took it and began to read it aloud. Usicam simul et finis permitas, in via al tempus incipio, quaris quid sit musica te ad sui dimenioncibus, mutai videntur, tolle cotio lisiet, perficere investigatio tua plina coram nenia, es non inveniet vitam somnus tus lactus cantus. What does any of this mean? <laughs> it sounds like some ancient Sumerian curse or something. Neil reached into his pocket and fished out a cigarette, lit it, and then ran his hands through his hair. He took a long, exaggerated drag. Well, guys, I did a bit of research scouring the internet and found out what it means. This is why I called you here. This is what's going to blow your minds. Apparently, if you place a record on the phonograph and recite these words, you will magically be transported into the narrative of whatever song is playing. You don't really believe that shit, do you, Neil? I mean, anyone could have written that note. The chances of it being real, magical, and from a century ago are slim to none. How in the hell are we going to be transported into a fucking song? It makes absolutely no sense. On top of that, I don't believe in all that hocus pocus crap. I've got to get home for dinner. Come on, guys. Let's go. <laughs> have you tried it yet? Like, have you read those <laughs> words out and been sucked into a song? Neil placed his hand on the horn of the player. Well, my friends, I have not tried it yet. After all the research I've done, I found that people all over the internet have speculated about his existence for years. There are all kinds of stories, good and bad, lots of great adventures, even tales of people becoming trapped inside a song, unable to escape. From what I've read, if you don't get out before the song is over, you remain permanently stuck. Neil crushed his cigarette out on the bottom of his shoe. This might be legit. I'm in. If it works, I want to be the first to fight the dragon in Judas Priest Green Manalishi. You got the record out there, right? Let's do this shit right now. Let's fight the fucking dragon right here and right now. Calm down, Jim. Yeah, we have that record out there. But I think we should approach this with a bit of caution. Not sure if I believe any of it, but I sure as hell want to give it a whirl too. So here's what I'm thinking. Assuming you aren't too afraid, why don't you come back here tomorrow and we will find a record with a good epic adventure and see if this thing really works. So go home, get a good night's sleep, and let's reconvene in the morning. Have you lost your goddamn mind? You really expect me to believe that putting a song on that gold piece of crap is going to transport me somewhere? Basic laws of physics, Neil, it can't fucking happen. Neil calmly placed his hand on Squid's shoulder. Well... Show up here tomorrow afternoon, tough guy, and let's see what happens. I am a bit skeptical myself, but from what I hear, this is the real deal. Now go and get home for dinner before your parents ground you, and let's meet up back here tomorrow. The boys fist-pumped Neil's hand on the way out the door and headed for home. The sky was just beginning to darken, but if they hustled, they could make it home before their parents returned home from work, and everything would be all right. The next day, it was impossible to sit still in school. And on more than one occasion, the boys thought seriously about skipping out and heading over to Silver Platter Records to see if that old phonograph really was able to transport them into distant lands. They knew, however, that the school's resource officer would be on to them immediately, and if caught, the boys would end up in after-school detention and miss the chance completely. So, with an almost painfully anxious anticipation, the boys made it through the day, but when that two o'clock dismissal bell rang, they were off and running to meet at the back patio of the school. Together, the four friends, dressed in denim and leather, walked with an extra bounce in their steps as they made their way to the record store. Neil was waiting for them as they bounded through the front door. Hey guys, great to see you. Why don't you guys comb through the record bins and come up with an album you all agree on? And make sure it has a cool adventure theme to it. As Soon as these customers leave, we can convene in the back again. I was thinking about this last night, and it might be worth noting, if this thing does work, we don't want to find ourselves in the middle of a bad situation, so maybe stay away from records like Venom's Welcome to Hell, 
at least for the time being. A customer brought her selections to the register, so Neil quickly wrapped up his conversation and turned his attention to her. The boys scattered throughout the store, rifling through the bins in search of the perfect epic adventure. None of them really believed this would work, but if they were honest with each other, they would all know that there was more than a slight hope floating in the backs of their minds that they would end up on some crazy adventure. Holy shit! These two would be frickin' dope. Sad Wings of Destiny by Judas Priest? How frickin' cool would it be to go back to old London times with Jack the Ripper? I mean, the Ripper is one of the best Priest songs ever anyway, but to actually go back and see that? Man, that would be great. I vote for this one for sure. Or if we wanted something a little scarier, we could try this one. Overkill has always been one of my favorite bands, and well, the title track is about an evil dude on a horse kicking ass and taking names. That could be a fucking trip. What do you say, guys? Well, Neil said not to start with anything too scary or evil, right? And, well, I don't believe this is going to work. If it does, I don't want my first adventure into the unknown to end with my death or worse, being trapped in hell or something. Guys, guys, here are the ones we need. Essential salts and primordials coffin ships. Not only would these be historical, they would be off the fucking chain as well. I say we use one of these first. Uh, those are all good ones. But I have two that are great ones as well. So check it out, bitches. Creeping death off of Metallica's Ride the Lightning. This is Bible-related stuff. How bad of an adventure could that be, huh? Also, what about Indians from Anthrax? That is historical, and perhaps not as dangerous or as an evil as a horseback rider taking names or whatever the hell he just said. Everyone was used to waiting on Bonger, and today was no exception. He never did anything at a normal pace, and pretty much had only one speed, that of a snail. I have the best ones yet. We can go experience Dr. Death in World War II with Slayer's Angels of Death. I think that would be rad as hell. I mean, it is historical. And well, maybe, if this works, we can kick his ass and prevent a lot of people from dying at his hands. Just how are you going to kick the crap out of Dr. Death? You must weigh 90 pounds soaking wet. I will take off this spike belt and fuck him up good. Also, I think you are all forgetting the most obvious ones of all. Either The Trooper or Two Minutes to Midnight by Iron Maiden. They would also be quite killer adventures and not as evil or dangerous. Maybe we could try something a bit tame at first, and if it all goes well, we can work up the, to one of the crazier songs. Alright, let's take a deep breath. I kind of agree with Bonger about staying on the safer side, so perhaps we give the Ripper a spin. I mean, a trip back to Whitechapel, England might be great. And the legendary Ripper only attacked hookers and women of the night, so theoretically we should be safe. And not only that, but what if we uncover who the Ripper really was? Historians have been speculating forever. Maybe we could be the ones that actually put a face and name to the purveyor of those ghastly crimes. The group gathered in the back storeroom once again. Neil slid the black vinyl disc out of its sleeve and placed it gently on the turntable. The boys became quiet as all eyes focused on Neil. He lowered the record onto the aged green felt. There, now hand me that piece of paper over there. And if you're all ready, we can give this a shot. I think at least one of us should stay here in the shop in case something goes wrong. I'm going. After all, I picked this freaking song. All right, let's draw straws to see who's gonna stay out here. Neil went back to the counter and took three different sized pencils from the jar by the register. All right, so we know I'm gonna give this a shot since I found the machine and Jim picked the tune, so it's between you guys. Neil placed the pencils behind his back and shuffled them around. He held them out to the boys. All right, the shortest pencil stays behind. Hesitantly, each boy selected a pencil from Neil's closed fist. After the last draw, they held them up and compared them with each other. From what I've read online, someone needs to make sure the power stays on and the record keeps playing. If the record stops spinning for any reason, we are lost. I have a backup generator on the store and you just need to make sure that no matter what, this record continues to spin. <sighs> Guess I'm staying behind here in the store. Assuming this works, how in the hell am I supposed to help you guys if something goes wrong? How am I even going to know if something has gone wrong if I can't see you? Neil stepped up on the platform where the phonograph was sitting. Ready, boys? 
All aboard, that's going aboard. Squids, Bonger, and Jim joined Neil on the tiny platform as Neil pulled out the scrap of paper. All right, guys, it's the moment of truth. We need to hold hands and close our eyes. I'll read this aloud, and if all goes as planned, we'll be in East London in mere moments. Shall we? Neil held the yellowing paper in front of him. The boys held each other's hands tightly and closed them with a mix of anticipation and terror. Chainsaw watched from the back of the room, prepared to come to the rescue if needed, although he had no idea what he would do to save his friends if something went wrong. Start the track now, Chainsaw. Chainsaw gently placed the needle on the record. The cone-shaped speaker came to life, hissing and popping, and after a moment, that classic Glenn Tipton, K.K. Downing riff that all metalheads immediately recognize as The Ripper began blaring from the speakers. Musicam simule fini permitas in via ad tempus incipio. With Neil's increasing volume, droplets of sweat began collecting between their clasped hands. Suddenly, Neil's voice became sharply louder as he continued. Quaris quid sit musicate ad suis dimensionobus mutari videntur. As Neil continued, their grips grew tighter and the sweating increased. Tole quadio licet perficier investigatio tua plena corum nania es non inventie in vitam somnus tus lacus cantus. There was a loud bang and a bright flash of light as Chainsaw was knocked to the ground. Cautiously rising, he rubbed his head and looked around, trying to regain his composure. What was that loud buzzing noise? He turned to where the phonograph was sitting, and his jaw dropped in total disbelief. All four of his friends were gone. Chainsaw scanned the room once again, but they were nowhere to be found. He gathered his senses enough to remember that he had to make sure the record kept spinning. Neil had left him behind solely for that purpose. And now, since this appeared to have worked, he had the incredibly important job of making sure his friends could return. What the hell just happened? Elsewhere, Jim, rubbing his eyes and shaking his head, tried to stand up and gather his bearings. Neil? Bonger? You here? Squids? Come on, man. Where the hell are you? This isn't a joke. Where the hell are you? Jim put his hands on his head and squeezed. His brain was pounding inside his skull. From what he could tell, he was laying on the damp, cold, cobblestone street. A heavy mist hung over the area. The only element he could make out was an extremely foul, dank odor. I... I think the freaking phonograph worked. I think we're in fucking Whitechapel, England. We're in that goddamn priest song. Holy shit, Jim. Look at our clothes. Neil stood and brushed the dust from his clothes. A smile broke across Neil's face and he patted Jim on the back. We're in a fucking Judas Priest song! It really worked! Now we need to find the rest of those guys and go explore. We have a very short opportunity to actually bump into and identify one of the most notorious criminals of all time. We have to find the other two and remember, if we don't get out by the end of the song, we'll be stuck in here. Jim took hold of the back of Neil's double-breasted waistcoat, and the two continued calling for their friends. Bonger! Bonger! Squits! Squits! Where you guys at? Up ahead, Neil and Jim could bake out a gas-lit lamppost, illuminating a doorway with a hand-carved wooden sign over it that read, The Ten Bells Pub, an establishment that Neil, as a massive history buff, knew was linked to many of the Ripper's victims. They would need to be extremely careful as this proverbial shit was starting to get real. The fog was as thick as Neil had ever seen, and he stumbled a bit as his foot made contact with the curb. Jim was still right behind him. The two gathered their wits and paused just outside the pub. Over there! Jim yelled, pointing towards Bonger and Squits, who were leaning up against the side of a building, looking completely baffled and lost. Bonger, Squits, yo! Holy shit! Oh man, is it good to see you guys. I had no idea where I was. I mean, where we were. 
Oh man, is it good to see you guys. This actually worked. I think that money spent on the turntable was well worth it. Guys, we're in fucking Whitechapel, England. In like the 1800s or something. What should we do first? Well, since we're standing right in front of the bar and I don't think there was a drinking age back in the day, I vote for stopping in the Ten Bells pub and getting a drink. Maybe some of that absinthe everyone drank. The four cautiously entered the bar. The customers were packed in tightly, like sardines in a can, but everyone seemed to be having a good time. While waiting for his drink, Jim glanced around at all the burn marks and beer stains that had collected on the green felt of what looked like a pool table, but it was clearly different. Perhaps a snooker table? Jim had heard about these before, but he had never seen one. He could also vaguely discern what looked like decorations remaining from past holidays. In the far corner, Jim could see a crudely hand-carved wooden sign that read YCJCYASF. After a minute, the bartender appeared with a small glass, a slotted spoon, a sugar cube, and a petite pitcher of ice water. He quickly placed the spoon over the glass and slowly trickled a slight amount of water through the sugar cube into the absinthe in the glasses. Hey bartender, what do those letters mean? An immense grin spread across the bartender's face, revealing several gaping holes in his less than pearly whites. He grabbed a small silver handbell from behind the bar and rang it loudly. We got ourselves another curious sucker. Well, my young friend, it actually means your curiosity just costs you another shilling. You are the sucker. And well, you owe me a shilling. Jim laughed, then reached into the front pocket of his thick woolen jeans, frantically searching for a shilling, whatever that was. He was sure he had read about shillings in books, but he would not know one if it reached up and bit him on the leg. A wash of fear rolled over him as he realized not only did he not have one damn shilling for the stupid trick he had been conned into, but he also had no money to pay for all the absinthe they had ordered. The bartender seemed to become a bit antsy as he watched Jim fishing around his jacket and pants for the money. He raised his eyebrows in the direction of a big, burly-looking bouncer who appeared as though his clothes were two sizes too small. The bouncer, in turn, removed what appeared to be a large wooden club from behind the bar and began swinging it lightly into his hand in a threatening gesture. What the fuck are we going to do? All four came to the same conclusion at the exact same time. Run like hell. Go! Now! And just like that, they were bolting through the crowd, out the door, and down the cobblestone alley. Neither Neil nor the boys even bothered to look over their shoulder until the Ten Bells pub and that crazy overstuffed bouncer were just a blur on the horizon behind them. Woohoo! That was some shit! I knew we could outrun that fat bastard! That was so fucking cool! The group took a moment to catch their breath and collect themselves in the dark and dreary cobblestone alleyway before venturing out into, according to what the small wooden sign advised, was Mitre Square. The square and nearly everything around it was barren on this gloomy, murky September morning. Suddenly, they saw what appeared to be a man with a reddish neckerchief, a pepper and salt colored loose fitting jacket, and a gray peaked cloth cap. He was running at top speed out of the square and down the narrow church passage from Duke Street and then disappeared into the fog near a row of warehouses. Neil, Jim, Bonger, and Squids made their way towards where the man had run from when they made a gruesome discovery. Holy shit! Guys, there is a body over here against the lamppost. What the fuck? Was that Jack the Ripper we just saw running down the alley? Jim, forget about him. We need to see if she's still alive. Neil, rushing over to her, knelt down to feel for a pulse. Shit! No pulse and there's so much blood coming from this gash in her windpipe. Neil placed his hands on the severed windpipe, attempting to staunch the blood flow as Squits gently pulled her dress down back over her body. What do we do now? Do we chase after him or do we get the hell out of here? The constable makes his rounds through the square every 15 minutes or so and it won't be long till he discovers the body and all of us hanging around. 
It is not going to look so good. We can't afford to be separated and end up in a Victorian jail. We would never make it back. I think we should get the hell out of here. I don't want to get involved. I mean, we could end up being blamed for this. And what if our interaction here changes the course of history? It could be possible. Let's get out of here. Like, now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Neil did say, if we don't get out of the song in time, we will be stuck here. And while I think this was quite interesting, I'm not ready to become a permanent resident of Whitechapel. All right. You are right, Squits, but I really want to find out who the Ripper really is. We are so close. We could solve one of the greatest mysteries of all time. No time for that, Neil. I think I hear footsteps. That could be the constable. Let's recite that verse and get the hell out of here. Neil wiped the blood from his hands onto his coarse pants and then reached out his hands to the others. Come on, hurry up, we gotta go! Neil thrust his hand into his pocket and retrieved the crumpled scrap of paper, swiftly attempting to read the words aloud once again. Musicam simule finis permitas in via ad tempus sensipio. Quares quid sit musica te ad suis dimensionobis mutari videntur. Tole quatio licet perfecir investigatio tua plena corum nania. Es non inveniet vitem somnes tus locus cantus. The footsteps grew louder as the obscure image of a constable approached. They could see his shadow in the hue given off by the gaslight lamps. There was a large flash of light and a massive bang as the group found themselves transported back to the storeroom of the record store. Holy shit! We, we made it back in one piece! That was fucking epic! Oh, I can't believe we just got a glimpse of Jack the Ripper. We were in the song and witnessed history all at the same time. Neil, Neil, Neil. You are the fucking best. I never thought this would work, but that was the craziest, coolest thing I've ever done in my goddamn life, dude. I gotta give it up for you, Neil. I was quite skeptical, but this was incredible, and I can't wait to find more songs to continue our adventures. You are the man. Welcome back, guys. From the looks on your faces, it must have really worked. I'm jealous as hell, and I guarantee you that the next time, I am not going to be the one sitting and watching the turntable. Guys, that was absolutely much better than I thought it was going to be, and I think there are endless possibilities for where we can go. For now though, make sure to keep this under wraps as no one would ever believe us, and even if they did, we don't want to share the adventure. For now, let's get out of here and head home. I need to process what just happened, and then we can plan our next adventure. The boys gathered themselves together, smiled, fist bumped, and left the store with a bit of an extra bounce in their steps. The possibilities were endless now.